Well, I wanna personally, on behalf of my wife and I, our entire team, I wanna say welcome to all of you that may be our guests for the first time. In fact, we hope you feel like you're coming home, like it's family. We've prepared uh, today really to greet you. I also wanna look in the camera, welcome our McKinney campus, our Hazlitt campus, all of those that are joining us online. We're glad you're with us this weekend. Would you put your hands together and welcome everybody that's joining in with us. I wanna say to all of you that are part of the Milestone family, we welcome all our guests, but I have to say that it is such a joy and a privilege to be your pastor. Uh, it's, just, it's just a joy when you get it. You guys get it. You guys have sacrificed and loved and prayed, and it's been a several-year journey, and your generosity is overwhelming. And uh, I just wanna say how grateful I am for you and how thankful I am for all of you. And we have this big moment where it's, it's, a, it's a marking of a new season. It's a celebration. And uh, we just thank God for all he's done. In fact, I wanna make sure that we also, when we come into a new moment, we wanna thank the, the giver of all good gifts. See, every good and perfect gift not, not just new space, but new relationships and a new opportunity to be a part of what Jesus is doing in our generation, the, the love we feel, the gratitude that we experience. Uh, everything we've been able to do is because he first gave to us. So I wanna give the honor, the credit, the glory, and all of the praise. Let's just do it right now. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done all that you've been so good to us with, and we celebrate this day. I'm gonna ask if you have your Bibles to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter two. I wanna invite all of you to join us on the journey for miracles. Next weekend, I will start an introductory set of messages, and then right after Labor Day, we will go on a journey with a resource and with small groups, and this is just how we do it at Milestone. You know, that's how the Bible was studied for centuries, not in a vacuum, but in a relationship and family, and so we found over the years this is a great way to do it, so I'm calling on everybody, the train, whoop, whoop, it's about to leave the station, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to, I learned a lot through just studying the miracles of Jesus. Went to Israel, there's gonna be videos every week of the context of the passage and showing you the Bible for the next several weeks. It's gonna be a great journey. But this weekend, uh, you know, as a pastor, when you open new space, you just get a pass to talk about what you wanna talk about. Are y'all with me? And we want to teach you the Bible. We're going to go to the Word of God today, but I want everyone here, I know that there's some of you that are new or tuning in, and you may be saying, man, this is a great new space. What do these people care about? Well, who are they? I mean, they seem nice and friendly, and by the way, a lot of times that's what I hear. I did our Discovery 101, there's 168 people last weekend. I stood and shook every hand, stayed till 3.30, and everybody just said, man, people are so friendly, people are so warm, people are so kind. You may be thinking, did you gather all the friendly people? Did you guys do like a hotel PR training, kind of like a customer service training? You guys got all the friendly people in the Metroplex in one church? How did that work? By the way, we're not... We're not taking any new mean people. If you're, you're, we, we got enough of those, so you can't, can't be mean and go here. Right? <laughs> but, but it's more than friendliness. I want to tell you about what it really is. It's not a, a strategy. It's not pragmatism. It's actually very biblical. It's actually very spiritual, what you're experiencing. I'd like to spend a few moments, because I know some of you are wondering what, what motivates these people. Well, we, we sang about it. Our, our motivation is centered around the person of Jesus Christ and the way he lived his life and the word of God, and that moves us to some value systems. It moves us to prioritize our lives in a certain way. It, it moves us to relate to others in a certain way, to relate to God in a certain way. And I like to say it this way, you're, you're eating from the apple pie, I'd like to tell you about the recipe. I'd like to show you how to make it in your own life, in your own home. 
I'd like to give you a little more of the behind the scenes and the heart behind who it is that we are because we, we are opening new seats, but we don't have a new vision. We, we don't have a new culture. We don't have a new plan. We still want to be who God's called us to be, and we want to stay on track with the plan that he's given us. See, it's not even my vision it's God's vision, and I'm just trying to articulate it to you so we can rally around what God's called us to do and who God's called us to be. And here's what I know. You can come into a space where there's new space and new things and a lot of exciting stuff and some bells and whistles and some cool stuff for the kids, and you can see it wrong. You, you can miss the main thing. You can miss what's really behind it all. It's easy. Have you ever had one of those moments where you're looking at all the exteriors? You know, what makes a great church is not the exteriors. It's, it's, the, it's the things that you don't see all week. It's the, it's the things that can be a little bit intangible that are behind the scenes. But you can miss it. You can really be in a moment where you see it one way and miss it. I remember one of my favorite stories to tell is uh, I remember as a young guy, I went to this ministry conference. I was with these guys, these these are kind of my heroes, you know, these older guys. I was like 24 years old and I went to this thing and they were having this conference and there's all these people I look up to and I was sitting somewhere right out in that area over there and, you know, a young guy, you know, you, you're kind of inside, you know, you're kind of like, you know, maybe they might let me get on that platform, you know? But I was like, man, I got, I got some things to say, man. I, during the conference, you know, you're going along, you're thinking, man, if they let me get up there, boy, I tell you, I got, I got the homolytic honey will drip off of my lips, you know? <laughs> and during the middle of the conference, the man there, he's leading the thing, you know, he looks back that way and he goes, like this. I thought, finally, they've recognized my deposit. They've seen the gifting that lives on the inside of me. And so I look, he, he looked that way again. He goes, I thought, yeah. I start walking to the front. I can feel it bubbling up. I can feel the power. I'm like, man, it's about to be on. I'm walking down. People start looking. Mike Banus is there. Jed's there. They were literally there. They're looking. They're like, What's Little doing? <laughs> and as I'm walking toward the front, the head of the conference, I notice he's not looking at me. He's looking at an usher. He's actually calling for the usher. Now I'm pot committed. Everyone sees me. Back in the old days, we used to have those wood tables that say, do this in remembrance of me. Y'all remember those? And there was a plant up there, luckily, and I just kind of walked up and adjusted the plant. And <laughs> went back and sat down. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> I was in the room, but missed the whole thing because I was looking at it from the wrong perspective. God is moving among us. I don't want you to miss it. In fact, we have a text thread as pastors. We just, all summer, we just have been texting each other, a, a bunch of us, just all the things. We had students join us, 100 students for Next Gen Student Leadership. We've had more kids go to camp than we've ever had, a 56 camp in seventh and eighth grade and high school camp. And, 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 and you see this, our, our students worshiping all summer in the commons. Like, like they didn't even have a, a place to work, but they still had just seven, 800 students on Wednesday nights in the commons and, and, and all of the students touched at Vacation Bible School and, and we had the, a large 301 class. We've been telling you all summer, be informed, be involved, be inviting. That's what I love about you. You guys have been doing it. And, and it's not that I'm telling you that just to tell you, it's because on the other side of your step, there's where God meets you, and he's been meeting people, and, 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 and I mean this. Again, this is not exaggerative preaching. Like, I found myself on that text thread going, wow, 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 oh, and it's like one after the other. You know, there's a place in the New Testament where it says God was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm like, that day is this day. Wow. Wow. We don't take it for granted. We're humbled by it. We want to thank God for it. I, I, this is sort of, I can't tell. I can't share you the whole text thread. This one got me emotional, though. This is a single mom talking to a young girl, saying, "Don't be scared to go into VBS." And she's there talking to her and encouraging her. And what she doesn't know is 
she encourages her to go to vacation Bible school when she's scared. And in another classroom, her oldest daughter was committing her life to Christ. That's church. I have a special place in my heart for Vacation Bible School because my parents were, were first generation Christians. My mom, she walked down a little road to a little church that had Vacation Bible School. She gave her life to Christ at that Vacation Bible School. She became my intercessor, my prayer warrior. She prayed me into the kingdom. She prayed me into my calling. And it was because of a little moment like that in a little church in East Texas in the middle of nowhere. I remember I didn't want to be a pastor. I'd met many that weren't miserable. No offense, but I didn't. I just didn't know many. I thought, I don't think I can do that. So when I went to college, I decided to be a counselor. I came home for the summer. I said, Mom, I've decided to be a counselor. She said, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. You will preach the gospel, come on now. Y'all thankful for the moms and grandmas and prayed us all into the kingdom of God. I, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. That's what church is all about. We've been seeing God move among us. We don't take it for granted. We approach him with humility. We say, Lord, I wanna be a part. I want, when your eyes search to and fro across the whole earth, I wanna be one of those that you see faithful that wants to be a part of what you're doing in my generation. I wanna take you to this passage of scripture, 1 Peter chapter two, and I wanna put some biblical context around something that I see lacking in today's culture and world. Something that in the overemphasis of other things, we've underemphasized the apostle Peter who walked with Jesus, who's later in his life now giving us some encouragement that I don't see a lot of people understand from the word of God. Now, before I take you to the passage, I wanna give you some biblical historical context. One thing a lot of people miss today is that God is everywhere, but he also uniquely manifests himself in unique places and scenarios and situations. He's everywhere, there's nowhere he's not, but he is distinctly somewhere in different ways. And that has to do with how he works and how he moves and how he moves within structures, how he moves within a facilitation of places that he can habitate in, that he can dwell in. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis he created man to be with them. He walked with them in the cool of the day. Sin broke that fellowship, but yet he kept coming to be with his people. But we only see in the Old Testament that he came to special people. Abraham and Jacob and Moses, he came to be with. By the way, I would like to highlight, I didn't get these graphics off the internet. A young lady that works on my team illustrated this named Haley. So isn't it amazing to receive from the gifts of the body of Christ? Isn't this really cool? Amazing. But he would come with these special people at these altars and, and at burning bushes and in these moments. But then they set up a dwelling. They moved this mobile church around where God would meet with them in the tabernacle. And they would move this place around and God would show up. And then they built a temple, a, a structure made by human hands where God would be in that holy of holies with his manifested holiness and presence. And God would be there. He would be present there in that structure. You say, well, that's the Old Testament. And what does that have to do with us today? Well, the Bible clearly shows us at the shift I want everyone to know today, if you don't know, that when you invite Jesus into your life, you don't join a religion, you join a relationship with a living God who comes to not dwell in new human structures alone. He dwells within the temple that is the body. He lives within us. He comes to be with us in that structure of your soul and spirit, if you will. 
And there's a lot of people that don't know that. If you don't know that today, he wants to come be with you, live with you, save you, wash you clean, make you righteous. You'll never be able to do enough to become righteous. You will become righteous when you receive his gift of salvation. When you receive him, he changes you and now he lives on the inside of you. But this passage, I see a lot of people today who know how to have some of this And we live in a content distribution Christianity world today. He who knows the most about this is the most mature, but the Bible doesn't define he who knows the most is the most mature. It's he who can live it among his people. And so there is a Another step that Peter gives us in this passage that is really consistent with scripture that I see a lot of people are not experiencing today, but it's been the foundation of what you're tasting here, that we want everything Jesus has for us, but we want to not stop there because when we get close to Jesus, we see what Peter was taught by him. Peter says this, as you come to him, You gotta come to him first. It's not a organized check a box. You gotta come to him. He's a living stone. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is alive today? We don't worship a statue, a figment of our imagination, a dead religious hero that has a grave with a body in it. We worship the risen King of Kings and Lord of Lords who's alive today. He's living among us. He's working among us. He knows your future better than you know your past. He's alive today. He was rejected by humans though, but he was chosen by God and precious to him. But he says now you also after you come to him, you are like living stones. For two weeks I've been meditating on alive stones. What a metaphor, what a picture. A stone that's alive. First of all, it's not a brick. A brick is uniform, you just spit them out. It's a stone that's hewn out, shaped, very distinct, very unique, very much an individual stone, no stone being alike, but it's also unique, but also alive. Therein lies the problem. The reason that the stone has trouble participating in what Peter is saying is because the stone is alive. So the stone has a unique way of connecting to the other stones. It's like the old preachers, Romans 12 talks about, we're a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is it's always crawling off the altar. Living stones. You're being built into a spiritual house. You're not joining a religion, you're joining a relationship that then that relationship places you in a house. He's building a spiritual house. Not more seats for human structures, but more living stones connected together and built by him. A a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So I want us to ponder this living stone idea, this this structure idea that he's taking these stones and and he's building a wall and he's he's building a roof and he's 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 the foundation, by the way, the chief cornerstone. But but he's he's putting them together. It's it's always amazed me how he does that. It's it's, it's, it's just such an amazing thing when it happens. The thing I'm most excited about in our church is not the physical stones, but you, and how he's bringing you together, and how he's filling that place with his presence. Why is it so hard to find your place in this thing he's building? Because we're not, we're, we're stones, we're not bricks. We, we gotta be carefully placed, not just, just an assembly line of production and stacking. You you stack bricks, you place stones. And so there's a placing and, and it's never been harder in our world today of content distribution, convention, Christianity, convenience. And we live in a world today where we've had, by the way we do life, we had to create new words to describe our new way of doing life, very different than this world in which Peter is talking. 
Truth is, this Bible is way more like Africa or the East than it is like the way we live in our individualized playlist, our individualized everything around our lives, our, our over-celebration of all of who we are at the expense of what God wants to do in our lives. And so you see this plan that Peter has, but in our world today, it's never been harder. We, we have now the ability through technology, just think about the words, you know, 30, 40 years ago, ghosted was something that happened on Halloween. <laughs> Zoom was what was described behind a car on a cartoon. <laughs> FaceTime is when your mom came out after the evening news with avocado on her face. Anybody remember that? Mom, you turned green. And did you know with all those new words, we have a new word that sociologists are using for the culture we live in today called crowded loneliness. I'm around more people than I've ever been around. I'm around the crowds of people, but I don't have the people in my life who wanna see me fulfill the plan God has for my life. I'm a, I'm a brick laying on the side of the road. I'm not a stone placed in a spiritual house. And because we don't value that or don't know that or haven't read that, we experience the fruit of that. It can be hard to get placed. But what happens in a spiritual house? Well, I love it. It's amazing. It's the only thing that, that in a spiritual house is the only place I see this really happening is, is you have unity and diversity. You, you have these diverse stones. They're from different socioeconomic backgrounds and different religious backgrounds and, and different ethnic backgrounds and, and different cultures and different experiences and different problems and different circumstances. But somehow, some way, God brings them together and, and there's a unity that can only happen through Jesus. And when they get over offenses and they, 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 they see everyone today, I heard a, a person today say, I've really learned to love myself. I'm like, well, why would you do that? The Bible tells you to die to yourself. You die to yourself to be a part of a spiritual house. Oh, it's not about my music style, my preference, my thing, my pet thing, my side little belief about everything in the end times whatever it is, politics, whatever it is. We get, we get so dragged into the ditch of superfluous stuff, we miss the spiritual house. Oh yeah, in our world today where everybody has an opinion and now we got a platform to hear all the dumb ones. In a spiritual house, there's unity and diversity and, and then there becomes this willingness of that living stone to do its part in holding up the wall. What a beautiful thing. When God says in Psalm 133, where I find unity, not where I find great seats. Not, not where I find real gifted, talented, amazing people. No, no, no. Where I find unity, I will command a blessing into that atmosphere. I will touch that place where I find unity. What a beautiful picture that's seen in that house, unity and diversity. I need to tell you, if you're new, you. You come to our first step, we call it Membership 101, it's just the first place we get to meet you. When you come to that, you'll hear me say this, because I feel like if you're coming to a church, you need to know what the movie screen the pastor sees ahead of him. What, what does he really get passionate about? I, I need to make sure you know that. I'm real excited about this weekend. I put my uniform on Wednesday. Got my eye black on, it's Super Bowl Sunday, move in weekend. It's exciting. More people to talk to doesn't really give me the ultimate fulfillment because if just more people to talk to was all we were trying to do, I know this after 30 years of ministry, it's not real fulfilling long term because if that were my goal, we don't just need to add a few seats here so that we can keep coming together and doing next steps and grow track and getting together and taking care of each other and bearing one another's burdens and learning together and doing miracles together. We just need to go ahead and cut right to the chase and rent out Texas Motor Speedway and let's just see how many people we can get there so the bald guy can talk to them. It would be an amazing, I, if they invite me to Texas Motor Speedway, I don't know, 300,000, we fill the thing up, 235,000, get the lawn, get everybody in there. 
Maybe they'll all be sober. I don't know. We'll get them all in there. And <laughs> I'll get out there with a microphone. Today, I consider myself the luckiest preacher on the face of the earth, of the earth, of the earth. <laughs> and man, I would preach the gospel, and then I would know I would leave, and here's what I would think. I wonder who's going to disciple that guy that came to Christ. I wonder how they're going to get connected. I wonder who's going to be there to pray for them. I wonder who's going to journey with them. I, the pastor heart in me would be like, that was exciting, but it's so not complete. So I don't live for that picture. I like that part of it, but it's not the full thing. For me, I live with a picture that one day at the end of my life on my deathbed, there's a group of people, my natural children, my grandchildren, the spiritual sons and daughters that have been raised up in this house that you see around, the young people that have yet to be trained, you, pastor, thank you for everything you poured into our life. We're gonna take it from here. That's a totally different, only spiritual houses can have that vision. Mobs can't have that vision. Only spiritual houses can have that vision. So I'm giving you a little essence this weekend. I'm, 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 I'm talking to you about, because you walk into a home, this is a home. It's not just more seats. It's a little bit bigger home. It's a little bigger house. And when you get placed, it has more of the essence of a house. And, and you walk into a, anybody's home, you walk in, you feel something. Well, yeah, you go to a house where there's a hospitality gift. Isn't it amazing? You walk in, man, I've been preparing for you. It's all good. My wife is a hospitable person. And so if you were coming over, you know, she would like somewhere around 35 candles. <laughs> this is a marital problem. I hate candles. I hate everything about candles. They give me headaches. I would begin to walk around. <sighs> it's like, Jeff, why are you blowing these out? Because I hate them. They're of the devil. There's a smell, there's a feel, there's a, there's a, and it's not just the candles, it's not just the decor, it's not just the food, it's the culture. It's the culture that you feel. Have you ever walked into a business or a home or a church or you're like, something's not right? You may not even know that mom and dad have tension, but you can feel it in the room. I'm giving you the essence, the ethos, some of those things. I'd like to give you some of our priorities that we built this house on and we plan even with new game zones and kid places to continue to build on a few of these things. The first one is the presence of God. Not only the presence of God that'll meet you when you go to work this week, the presence of God that'll meet you when you have a crisis with the child or wherever you're at, the presence of God for you individually, which is amazing. But also the presence of God that fills the structures. See, in the Old Testament, there's one picture of him filling structures where there was this group of bones that were dry in Ezekiel 37. They rattle, come together, and then it's not just the bones coming together as an army, it's that God's spirit filled the bones. New space without the spirit and presence of God is just new bricks, but living stones that he fills. There's another metaphor in the New Testament of the wine skin, where it's like, look, you can't receive the new wine because your wine skin is too brittle. Let me encourage all of you, as you, if you grow along in this thing, make sure you don't let your wine skin get so brittle that you can't see, see the new thing God's doing in your generation. We're encouraged to keep that wineskin stretching and flexing and open and connected. I, I wanna submit to you today that a message for today and where people are, and I know I'm one of you, that it's never been about the breath, God has plenty. It's never been about the wine, he doesn't run out or he'll just make some more like he did at a wedding. It's about the bones, about the skins and about the house. That's the hard part, because he fills it with his presence. There's a different and unique way, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered, where that place is. The second thing I wanna tell you is this is a place where we're not just coming together as a spiritual house to have a better house for us. When I get close to Jesus every time I do, 
He loves lost people. So this isn't a house where we put cameras up everywhere and security guards to lock down the house. We don't have a moat in front that we draw the drawbridge up and say, isn't it great this little presence moment we have here? Because what I've learned is if you draw the drawbridge up and you shut the shades and turn on the cameras and make it about you, it's amazing how God's presence is not there and unity begins to erode. When I get close to Jesus, I see him say, I came to seek and save that which is lost. Luke 15 is a great set of passages, by the way. I love this. It reminds you, when the Bible uses succession, it uses rep- repetition and equal emphasis. And there's a section of scriptures there that I think are really powerful. He starts with a sheep and says, one wanders off, and then they get that sheep and bring it back, and everyone celebrates, says, there's more joy. Everybody say, more joy. More joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who need not repentance. That's in the B-I-B-L-E. Then there's a coin and it's lost. We gotta turn the house upside down and Jesus doesn't play fair. He says, there's a kid. There's a kid. A kid who goes to his dad in Jewish culture, might as well have spit in his face, takes his inheritance, goes off into loose living. He ends up in trouble. There's no pain like kid pain. You can be at the peak of your career. You can be at all the levels of everything, but you have one child who's struggling. You're only as happy as your unhappiest child. So Jesus is touching us at the core of, I want you to love what I love. Kid hurting, ends up in a pig pen. The servants are treated better in, in, in my dad's house than I am. And, and, and he goes back wondering the response. The father doesn't say, well, you know, I just look what to all the things you've done to mess up. He runs, he greets him, he kisses him, puts a ring on his finger, kills a calf, says, let's have a party. By the way, the father heart of God is not just the character in the story. The lost son is not a character in the story only. The older brother's there too. A lot of older brothers in the house sometimes. Why are we, why are we having a party for my older brother? You've heard it. Well, they're just, that church, they're just, it's just, you know, they're just seeker driven. No, 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 we're Jesus driven. We're presence of God driven. But we're sensitive to the fact that there are people outside the family of God that the father wants his son to come back home. You know what the father says? Everything I've ever had is yours. You got access to everything. But your brother was lost and now he's home and he's found. Let's party. This is a celebration. I preached that over at our grocery store. 17, we moved to this campus. We used to be in a grocery store on 801 Keller Parkway behind Taco Casa. That's the house of the taco if you've never been there. And I preached that one weekend and I walked out after preaching about it and there was a man, well-dressed, sport coat, mid-50s, sharp dude. Walked up to me, his eyes were beet red. He'd been crying through that prodigal son message. And he had a picture, he said, Pastor, this is my prodigal, will you pray for him? I held that picture up in those services. I said, this is so-and-so's prodigal. We're gonna pray for him. And by the end of the weekend, I had little torn pieces of paper. Pray for mine, Pastor. Pray for mine, preacher, pray for mine. I I wanna make sure on this weekend as we move into this new space, thank God for the loving family that you are. I'm amazed at how you take care of each other, how you serve one another, how you love one another. Thank God for the spiritual house of God. But we wanna love what Jesus loves and he loves the one that he wants to have back home. Here's the next thing, clear next steps. We're always gonna put next steps, so we're not just into reaching people, we wanna build lives, we wanna help you walk out your faith, we wanna help you learn how to read your Bible, we wanna help you build your marriage on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. We don't just care about a spiritual house, we care that your house is a spiritual house. We want God's presence to be at your house, not just the church house. So we wanna help you learn how to follow God, we wanna help you learn how to handle your money God's way, We wanna help you take your next step. We like to say it this way, we're not just a group of people gathered or a mob of people, we're a family in a house taking the next step that God has for us. Here's the next one, the next generation. 
We started out years ago with a vision. God is moving among young people here at Milestone Church. We are seeing young people get right with God, get saved, find the call of God on their life. The next service, we will have our new cohort at Milestone College where we're training a generation of Christian ministers and leaders. And this is the first time on campus we'll have freshmen through senior. And see, spiritual families and houses raise children. For us, youth ministry and kids ministry and next-gen ministry is it's not a program. You know, we're not trying to get a hired hand to run our program. We have sons and daughters training sons and daughters. When you go to Vacation Bible School, what I love about it, it's not a program. You'll see layers. You'll see eighth graders serving sixth graders, and sixth graders serving fourth graders, and fourth graders serving two, because we don't believe there's a junior Holy Spirit. We don't believe there's a junior membership in the body of Christ. I was a 21-year-old senior pastor. I told some of those 18-year-olds, I said, in three years, you may be in charge. I didn't say I was a good one, I just said I was one. (laughs) When I look in the eyes of the next generation, they know I believe in them because I was one of them. We have a heart to see the next generation become who God's called them to be. I was standing last Sunday night, and I was just, you know, worshiping with our serve team, and I just just got emotional um, thinking about the goodness of God, and I had a thought, I lost my dad in 2019, and my dad loved our church. He lived three hours from here. He would pass out cards to people to come to our church. I'm like, Dad, they're not gonna drive three hours. He'd go to Walmart, you should go to this church. It's amazing. (laughs) I thought, man, I wish my dad could see, see, see this. I felt the Holy Spirit say, he does. See, when you live for a generational, eternal vision, all of us who pass it on to the next generation, we just join that great cloud of witnesses in the sky that is cheering on every generation coming behind us. The final thing is we wanna be a church that helps the hurting. I've got a phrase that I just keep saying. We're, we're not just a bigger church, we're, we're solving bigger problems. It's not about more seats, it's about more help. It's not just bigger environments, but it's a bigger heart. As we take care of code violations in our city, as we become the place people get water during Ice Mageddon, where we help single moms finish their college degrees and give them Christmas presents, as we help the fairy tale ball where parents of kids that have life threatening illnesses and we serve them. We wanna be a church that it matters, that our community actually says, I hope you get bigger. I hope you stay here. Please don't close your doors. Because it's not just about bigger, a spiritual house where the stones get connected. It's not a body that's just big and big. Anybody getting older? You get bigger and less mobile but a body that's connected can reach out and touch things. I love the way you help the hurting. This year's serve team, our serve day, we had 5,000 people in red shirts, 100 and something projects, solving problems for broken humanity. I get fired up about that. I wanna show you a living story of a church environment where a single mom is impacted and a son is now changed and walking toward what God has for him because of a, a house. Not a mob, but a, but a house can raise spiritual kids. Watch this story with me. I remember when I was about 11 years old, my mom sat me down to tell me that her and my dad were getting a divorce. I was pretty upset, worried about what my life would begin to look like. Um, after that. I just knew that from then on, life would look much different from what it did before. Being in a single income, single mom household, I was the now man of the house. She took the kind of role of just like toughing it up and doing what was best for like us boys. Being a single mom was not something that I prepared for. It wasn't something I planned and it just kind of happened. I think people see a lot of single moms that, you know, really killing it, you know, and and making it work and things like that. But, but, you know, there are times at night that you think about things and you're like, you wonder if you're doing it right. 
I knew that I needed to surround myself with women that were that were gonna support me, help me, because I didn't I didn't know what to do. We had been going a milestone, but it was nothing more than just going on the weekends. Like in my my view of church before was just we go, we leave, we get lunch, come home. And then it's like, okay, now we're not only just going on the weekends, but we're going to a small group another night at, at someone's house. I actually start developing relationships, developing friendships, and like, it's way easier to go through something when you got people around you. And church is what gave us that. I got a Facebook message and I got put into a group of Facebook milestone single moms. I go to the single moms dinner. They gave us these boxes. We opened up this box. There was a gift card from Walmart and it bought our groceries. Our lawnmower broke. An email came and said, would you like someone to come and mow your yard? I was like, yes, if you guys would do that, that would be awesome. And I couldn't even believe that someone would do that for, for us. They would give uh, single moms uh, scholarships for their kids to go to camp. Camp is what really changed everything for Garrig. That camp started planting seeds in my life of like God is a father to the fatherless. God is that heavenly father that like you can look at and like he'll look at you smiling because he's so proud of you. And that was the first time where all the Jesus stuff in my life finally started to click and finally started to make sense. And from that camp experience, my life was changed forever. Now what's cool is that God restored my parents' marriage. Now being able to go to church all together as a family, we're able to serve in different capacities. And we're able to give back to the church that gave so much to us whenever we needed it the most. Some people have a negative view of church or view church um, in a not so positive light. But for me, church was a place where I saw my mom as a single mom get supported and what she was going through. Church was the place that showed up to my house and mowed our yard when we didn't have a lawnmower. Church is a place where male role models poured into my life, where I was shown the love of Christ through men of God. Church is a place where as a young leader, I'm able to serve and to use my gifts and to show kids the same love of Christ that I was shown. Church was the place where I felt called to ministry, where I'm continually being able to be equipped trained and shown what it looks like to be a leader within the body of Christ. Amazing. That's, that's you, that's your impact when you become a living stone connected to the chief cornerstone in a spiritual house that God fills with his presence. I wanna ask you, I usually have you stand, but I'm gonna ask you just to stay seated because we're gonna have just a special moment here in just a moment for our miracle offering. But I wanna pray right now if there's one person, I believe there's maybe somebody here at the start of the message I talked about receiving Jesus and receiving him. So right where you are, you can just simply pray, Jesus, I, I give you my life. I made mistakes, but I believe that you died on the cross for me. You died on the cross for my sin. You rose from the dead. And Jesus, I receive you today as my personal Lord and Savior. Become my Jesus, come into my heart. I know there's somebody listening to me that prayed that prayer and I'm gonna ask you to let us know. Come forward at the end of the service. Come to our first step, Discovery 101. Let us know so that we can help you take steps and continue in your journey. I wanna pray though also for all of us, there's some of you here who you're not placed and God wants to help you get placed and, and you're a living stone and God wants to, to help you take steps. And so Lord, I pray right now you would place each and every person, Lord, that, that there would be a, a work of your spirit that's beyond my words to, to place people in your family. In Jesus' name, amen.